I've now just started the recording and I'm just going to go real quickly through the through the summary. And we've got seven chapters to summarize here, which is a bit more than what we were going through before, so I'll try to get through it kind of quickly here. So before we read through chapter 8, we'll start over in chapter 1. In chapter 1, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul introduces himself, and then he tells us who he's writing to. He's writing to the believers in Rome, and he also wants to visit them. In verses 16 to 17, we have a very important part of Romans. This is Paul's thesis, or his theme for Romans. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that's how Paul defines what he means when he says gospel in a general sense. But instead of telling us more about the gospel and God's power to save, Paul first tells us about the wrath of God in verse 18 of chapter 1. And this is why we actually need the gospel. Because the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all impiety and unrighteousness of people. And chapters 1 through 3, 320 up to, we learn about the wrath of God and the sinfulness of man. And this is why we need the gospel, because everybody has fallen short and everybody is a sinner. Chapter 3, verses 9 to 10, what then? Do we have an advantage? Not at all. For we have already charged both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Just as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. And he talks about the law a bit as well in chapter 2. However, in chapter 3, verse 20, For by the works of the law, no person will be declared righteous before him. And this is why we need salvation apart from the law. Verse 21, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being testified about by the law and the prophets. And verse 23 is another great one, along with up to 25. All right, so if we're all sinful and we can't be justified by the law, how do we, how do we become saved? Verse 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God made publicly available as the mercy seat through faith in his blood. And that is very important, through faith in his blood. And in chapter 4, we learn about Abraham, which it starts on the justification theme. So we've talked about sin, the universal sinfulness and wrath. And then starting in chapter 3, 21, up to chapter 5, the end of chapter 5, we talk about justification, how we are made justified, and so on and so forth. And Paul gives the example of Abraham in chapter 4, who was saved and you know, because of his belief in God, not because of his following the law or his obedience, though that did necessarily stem from his faith and belief in God. So that's chapter 4. It's about Abraham mostly. And in chapter 5, we talk about more justification, how we are reconciled with God through faith in Christ. And we also talk a little more about sinfulness Verse 12, because of this, just as sin entered into the world through one man and death through sin, so also death spread to all people because all sinned. But it doesn't stop there because the second Adam, that is Christ, also came and we can have justification through the one man, Jesus Christ, and multiplied to the many. And then in chapter 6, we move on a little bit from justification to righteous living, godly living. All right. We know, that <clears throat> we know that we're sinful. We know how to be justified. That's through faith in his blood. So what, what do we do now? And chapter 6, verse 1 asks that question. What therefore shall we say? Shall we continue in sin after we've been justified through the previous chapters in order that grace may increase? Paul says, may it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? It's not even an option for Paul to continue living in, in sin like that because we've died to sin. We've been crucified with Christ in that sense so that we die to sin and that we can live with Christ afterwards. And that is what chapter 6 is about. Chapter 7 is fairly similar. He gives an example through marriage. Verse 2 of chapter 7, For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. 
But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of the husband. And Paul uses that illustration to say, well, we are also dead to sin. And then we go through this internal conflict with sin in chapter 7, verses 13 to 25. And we looked at a few options with that last week. Is this about the believer or is it about the unbeliever? And we looked at both sides of that issue. And some people landed on one side, some people on the other. Some people said it was, you know, it could apply to both, that we have this struggle with sin. Even though we have this new nature, we might still have this struggle with sin if it is about the believer and can be applied there. So in chapter 8 now, with all of that context in mind, I'll just read the first verse there. Consequently, based on what we previously talked about through the other chapters, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ because we died to that law already that condemns us because of our sin. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And this is a different law than the law of Moses. This is a, the law of sin and death, which results because of our sin. And we'll talk about that a little more. So that is what chapter 8 is about. It's going to be primarily about godly living again and how we should live, who we are in Christ. And that is what chapter 8 is about. Do we have any volunteers to read us chapter 8 verses 1 to, let's say, 1 to 17? I will if you want. Yeah, that would be great. All right. This is the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Therefore... No condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus, because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. What the law could not do, since it was limited by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in flesh like ours under sin's domain, and as a sin offering, in order that the law's requirement would be accomplished in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh think about the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit about the things of the Spirit. For the mindset of the flesh is death. But the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law, for it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, since the spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. So then, brothers, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Wonderful. So we've just talked about how we are dead to sin. All right, that's the negative aspect. And then Paul brings us to the more uplifting aspect. Any thoughts on what we just read through so far? Anything that stood out to you? All right, one question I have is, I might just be quibbling over, over some words, but verse 3 of chapter 8, I think, should be addressed. For what was po impossible for the law in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. And here's what I'm my question is about, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning flesh, concerning sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. What does it mean that God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh? He sent him as a human. Okay. What, what, what about the sinful flesh part? Is, well, is... uh, the, the way that I heard on the American Gospel, and it's the way that uh, makes sense to me, is that he was sent on earth as 100% human and 100% God. So the 100% human part would be the fact that he was sent here. He, he's God, so he's perfect. But even Jesus was tempted to sin, the Bible says. I forget where it says it. So I, I guess 
it's, it's, a, it's sort of the way to understand where uh, Jesus gets like, why it's so difficult for an imperfect being to keep the law. And so he can, like, of course he would know regardless, but now he can say he has that perspective because he lived it. Yeah, that's interesting. So you're try- I guess you're saying that instead of maybe sinful flesh, this is more like sinnable flesh, maybe? That would probably be a better way to put it, yeah. Okay. It but, means in the likeness of sinful flesh. Yeah, that's exactly it. And <laughs> I just want to point out a really nice quote from John Stott here. He says, the verse says, not in sinful flesh, because the flesh of Jesus was sinless, nor in the likeness of flesh, because the flesh of Jesus was real, but in the likeness of sinful flesh, because the flesh of Jesus was both sinless and real. So it doesn't say that Jesus was was sent in sinful flesh, but just in the likeness of sinful flesh. For me, I feel like sinful flesh as he came to earth to feel all of our sin and take that upon him as sinful flesh like as our burden he felt and to carry that to the cross and on the mercy seat all right yeah that's definitely another good way to look at it yeah and trust jesus puts up a good verse there to make us not interpret you know verse three in in the wrong way it gives us that guideline for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weak weaknesses but one who in every aspect every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin so it's good not to swing the pendulum too far and say well sinful flesh means that jesus was was sinful no it's just the likeness of sinful flesh and yeah we talk about the the nature of jesus how he's both god and man and i think that's important as well to realize that he's both a hundred percent man and a hundred percent god however you want to Look at that exactly, but we see both of those in there. All right, so we'll move on from verse 3 a little bit. Does anyone have any other thoughts on the rest of the passage that we just read? Yeah, Conifer is bringing up Romans 8, 28 and 8, 31 to 34, and I definitely love those passages as well. We'll get to those eventually. We're still on 1 to 17, though. All right, one thing I want to point out then is verse 14 of chapter 8. For all those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Verse 15, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I think that's just a wonderful passage there, and it talks about us as children of God if we have the Spirit of God. And it goes on and says, all right, if children, then we're also heirs of God. And not only that, but fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer together with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And it seems that Paul's definition that he's working with here is, you know, do you have the Spirit of God? And he tells us in verse 5, We can have assurance of that if, for those who are living according to the flesh are intent on the things of the flesh, but those who are living according to the Spirit are intent on the things of the Spirit. And I think that's a great application for us. The question, are we intent on the things of the Spirit? And that's how we, that's one of the ways we can look at ourselves introspectively and figure out, are we really saved? Are we intent? on the things of the Spirit. So any thoughts on what we just looked at so far? Okay, lots of people, but not too much participation on the first passion, and that's fine. It's a pretty general passage, although it is very encouraging and uplifting. So we looked at being heirs, and I think A couple people are typing right now, so I'll just wait until they're done typing. Maybe they'll have some thoughts for us. All right, looks like Conifer's still typing. That's fine. One thing I want to point out is in verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you, then the 
sentence right after that, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ. And I thought that was really interesting. Paul says in verse 9, the Spirit of God, and then he immediately interchanges God for Christ there. Says the Spirit of Christ. And I think that is a is a wonderful verse as well. Just showing the nature of the Trinity and how Paul can just say, you know, the Spirit of God is the same as the Spirit of Christ in that sense. And not only that, but he interchanges God and Christ. It's not, all right, well, we got the Spirit of Christ here. We got the Spirit of God there. No, he simply interchanges those two things. That's what I really like about the Bible is the fact that um, Jesus could have went about it as to just bluntly say, yeah, I am God. But he, the way that he demonstrated how he is God was in such a profound way, wherein once he was put up on the cross and all the stuff happened where he died on the cross and they poked his side and such, there was no denying that he is indeed the son of God and he is who we said he is. And I mean, of course, these days there's many people who try to, to debunk it, but if you look back in scripture, there's historians that see the Bible, whether they're atheist or Christian or whatever else, as a genuine historical document. So the integrity of how it's held up over the years is just staggering, in my opinion. Yeah, and I liked how you mentioned how God, you know, reveals that and declares that. I mean, how Christ reveals and declares that. I think that's a great misunderstanding these days because, you know, Christ, as you said, he doesn't really flat out specifically say it, but he demonstrates it so many times that it's extremely clear and there can't be any question about it and that the the Jews who were persecuting him, they realized what he was he was doing. And he goes about in that method like a teacher would. You know, he doesn't give the flat out answer to his students, but he demonstrates that and especially for his disciples so that they would eventually come to that conclusion themselves after watching Christ work and what he says and what he claims about himself until they get to that final conclusion in their minds. You are the son of God. You are the Christ. And I think that's a great insight there. Looks like Conifer has finished. Romans 8.15 stood out to him. A lot of people seem to view Christianity as being a slave to the law as he describes it, but it's really about freedom from the law and being children of God. For we have not received the spirit of slavery, but of adoption. And that is an encouraging truth to remember that we don't have to make ourselves acceptable to God by being good enough, but we can be called God's sons and daughters. Definitely a great verse there. All right, I think we've we've covered verses 1 to 17 pretty well there. Paul talks about the different, he contrasts the flesh and he contrasts the spirit. And he tells us of, about our inheritance as sons and daughters of God and how we are fellow heirs with Christ. And we'll move on to verses 18 to 30 now. Do we have any volunteers for 18 to 30? Yeah, someone other than Hat. Yeah. Can you hear me, Mark? Yes, I can. Okay, this is the um, NASB. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Perfect. So there's a lot in this particular passage, but I want to quickly tie it in to the previous one that we just talked about, about adoption and being heirs. So my question is in verse 23 there. Not only this, but we ourselves also having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves while we wait eagerly our adoption, the redemption of our body. So in the previous passage, we just learned that we're sons and daughters of God. You know, verse 15 there, we've been given the spirit of adoption. But then in verse 23, Paul says we're waiting for our adoption. What does this mean? How do, you, how do how these passages reconcile? Well, it says in the Bible that uh, we are supposed to eagerly wait for uh, God to, for Jesus to come for the second time. And us eagerly awaiting him is, well, it says in the Bible that we can ask for him to come sooner as far as like that in times go and such. But uh, I was going to go somewhere with it. I'm sorry. No, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> that's all right. We know, we know you're sleepy. So yeah, we're definitely called to wait for something. But I guess my question is in verse 23, Paul says, while we wait eagerly our adoption, but in the previous passage that we just read, the previous chunk, Paul pretty much says that we're already adopted and we can already cry out, Abba, Father. What does this mean? Oh, yeah. I was going to say that uh, w- when we're in this life, uh, a lot of people see it as like, you know, we're going through sanctification, then uh, eternity starts from getting to heaven. But that's not true. Eternity starts right when we uh, trust in the Lord as our Savior and give him our life. Uh, eternity starts when it starts in this life and we carry out what God wants us to do into the world and tell people about the truth. Yeah, so basically, I think what you're saying is that we see some of the effects of this adoption, but there's still more to come, like the redemption of our body in verse 23. Yes. Yeah, and I would also like to cross-reference that with 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that whenever he is revealed, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. So we are now children of God, but what we will be has not yet been revealed. And that's the redemption of our body and when the second coming, glorification, so on and so forth. And I think that's a great, you know, reconciliation of those two passages. And also 1 Corinthians 13. Well, for now we see indistinctly as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. So uh, once once we pass away and we're before before our Lord, that's when that's when we receive our full inheritance. Yeah, that's definitely a great the, way the to redemption. look at it. Oh, no, sorry, okay. my net it's just okay. cut off sorry. a bit, and I didn't hear. No, anything. I paused for a while. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> um. The redemption of our bodies at the resurrection. Yeah, definitely. Man, everybody's bringing up cross-references. Trust Jesus also has 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5 here too. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So Spirit is a guarantee of what is to come that we still wait for, eagerly waiting. So that's a great another passage. So we've looked at verse 23 there, and we've tied it in to the previous chunk that we just read. Does anyone have any thoughts on the whole, on anything that we just read in 18 to 30 now, bringing it out to the rest of the passage? This isn't like, this isn't very theological. I just, when I was reading it, because I'm like really interested in like environmental issues, this passage, I think 18 to 23, where it talks about creation also groaning, 
uh, it made me think maybe that's why like the earth seems to be suffering so much because I guess that's like a part of the Adamic curse, right? That the whole earth is cursed until Jesus comes and redeems it. So I thought that was really interesting that it speaks about like creation, like animals or nature also suffering as a result of our sin and groaning within themselves, like longing for the return of Christ. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I really like that application. That's really good. Any other thoughts on the passage or just about nature that we just talked about? Something that I've always found so interesting is that within human nature, it's like we have this inherent good with us that's like not us because anything good that we do actually comes from Jesus and we're like used as a vessel for it. But it's the sort of thing where like we have this moral code inside of us that tells us what's good and what's bad and that we should go to good. But then we have this flesh that constantly conflicts with it that makes us do bad things. And I don't know, I guess that thing. I guess it's just always been so interesting to me how there's always that conflict within people. And it kind of touches on this within like the groaning within us. It's like the groaning within us is us saying, stop being such an idiot and stop making these bad decisions, but we have the flesh, so we're going to make these bad decisions. Yeah, that's really good. And it goes back to what we talked about last week. I just want to tie it into chapter 7 because we talked about that inner conflict with sin and how Paul was talking about, well, you know what's right, but you don't do that. And what you don't want to do, you do do that. And it's a little confusing, but it, it shows that conflict. And verse 21 in chapter 7, Consequently, I find the principle with me, the one who wants to do good, that evil is present with me. For I joyfully agree with the law of God in my inner person, but I observe another law in my members at war with the law of my mind making me captive to the law of sin that exists in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It looks like Conifer's bringing up 7, 5 to 10 as well, which also you know talks about that conflict it looks. and But sin, verse 8, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Oh, 715 he says, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very, very thing I hate. Another great verse there on the context of conflict. And I think the groaning in chapter 8, both the groaning in nature and the groaning in ourselves, ties in with chapter 7 very nicely. Any other thoughts on what we just went through 18 to 30. I um, I also wanted to talk about verses 28 to 30. I think, I, I don't know, there's something about like those two or those three verses that I feel like are worth breaking it down because I'm like really new to theology and I think this is something that like people who believe that God calls certain people um, or predestines certain people to salvation and chooses certain people over others. I think this is um, the verse that they use to prove that. Yeah, and here we go. Straight dive into Calvinism. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, basically, um, at least Calvinists and, and other people too, but generally speaking, we're looking at verses 28 to 30, and I want to focus on 29 to 30 for talking about predestination and things like that. Because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he should be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, these he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So we get this chain here, a chain for salvation, essentially. So first, God foreknows, and well, he foreknows everybody, but... He foreknows these particular people, and then he also predestines these particular people to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he should be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called those people. And the people that he called, he also justified those people. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So we get this, and it's called effectual calling. I'll just write that in here effectual calling. So it's not that, well, there is a sense in which God calls 
everybody to the gospel. But in this passage, he's talking about effectual calling <clears throat> because we know that not everybody is going all the way to glorification. We know that not everybody is saved. But in this passage, those who are called, they go to glorification. They go to justification. There, there's no doubt that they go all the way to that. So they have salvation. So it has to be a specific effectual calling there. And you can take this in a couple different ways. You can take this in the Calvinist sense, which we'll get to a lot in Romans chapter 9, where God says, He has mercy on whom he has mercy, and he hardens whom he will harden. And you can also take this in the Armenian sense as well. And here's a disclaimer. I'm not an Armenian. I'm, I'm a Calvinist, more on the Reformed side of things. So I, I can't really give this the respect and dignity of an argument that it deserves because I'm not just that I'm not that familiar with it and I don't really believe in it either but you could possibly take this in a couple different ways on the Armenian side those whom he foreknew they sometimes insert in here well those whom he foreknew would choose him in the future these he predestined so he foreknew in the future that they would be pretty decent and so he chose them in the past after seeing what they would do in the future. And that's one way to take it. But many commentators have problems with that interpretation. But another possible sense is that when you look at this 29 to 30, the other Armenian sense that you can take this is, well, you see God calling, you see God predestining people. But this passage, while it focuses on God and talks about God, it doesn't overrule, it doesn't exclude the possibility of any human responsibility or any human actions. While it focuses on God, it doesn't exclude the possibility of humans working as well somehow. So th those are the two senses, I think, that you can take it on the Armenian side. But as mentioned before, I'm a Calvinist. And we'll, we'll look at that a little more in chapter 9, especially. So any thoughts on what we just talked about? Maybe someone can, you know, help with that if, if you're a Calvinist or an Armenian. Get another perspective in here. All right, maybe it's just, just my perspective then. But hopefully, it looks like Conifer's talking. Oh, is Hat going to say something too? Yeah, I think that the Bible as a whole shows that God chose us before the foundations of the world and that throughout the whole Bible there are many verses that point to that and there are also verses that discuss no one seeks after God and I have not seen any variances in the Bible that say that there are some who do. <laughs> it says nobody does so if that's the case then how can somebody of their free own free will without God um, being behind it, how can they seek after God? It's only because of God that we are able to, that anybody is able to seek after him. God draws us and we respond. That's the only thing that can happen. That's all. Yeah, that's another great insight. I just want to point out that he chose us before the foundations of the world. That is Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 to 5. And I think that's just a great passage to read. Ephesians 1, 4-5, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, having predestined us to adoption through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And Revelation, it talks about having your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and there's just all kinds of indications throughout all of Scripture that we were chosen and that it's not because of us that we are able to respond to God and say, oh, yes, yeah, tough to argue for the Arminian side because it seems to me that Arminians must have a tough time believing there's nothing good in themselves. You know, people kind of, our sin nature makes us want to see that there's something good in us, but there's not. And so that's kind of maybe something behind Arminianism perhaps. Yeah, and I also, also oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, just like to piggyback off of what she said, the reason why I think a lot of Armenians have that belief is that it seems hard to believe that a, a kind God would choose certain people over others to be saved, even though we aren't any better than those who are going to hell. Like, without Jesus, we're 
on the same level as them. So it's almost like, well, why does he do that? You know, that seems kind of harsh. Good point. Yeah, people that uh, have have a tough time understanding that that every single one of us deserves to go to hell, and the fact that God chooses any of us, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's only by His grace and His love, and just how wonderful He is. It's not anything spiffy about us, that's for sure. Yeah, I guess the way. That, sorry, you go ahead. I was just gonna say that I guess the way that I've always seen it is that the reason why God has like the names He's chosen in the Book of Lambs is because since he's God, he can see in the future. Well, like, he knows the future. And therefore, he knows who is going to choose him and who is going to go. Well, I I say choose, but he chose us first. But he knows who is going to receive the gift of salvation, and he knows who's going to walk away from it. So I guess I've always seen it as God putting in the names is like, he knows that they're going to trust in him, and the other people aren't going to trust in him. Yeah, I just want to elaborate. Yeah, I just want to elaborate that a little more. That's definitely the Armenian perspective of things. But just like Hat mentioned earlier, there's this barrier to, you know, well, yes, God can foreknow who will choose him. But the problem is this barrier in chapter 3, 10 to 11 and further, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who even seeks God. Now, that's a great problem for the Armenian side, but the way they try to get around it, and I just, because it doesn't seem like we have any staunch Armenians here, I just want to try to give a little more light to their side. The Armenian would say, well, we have this this idea of prevenient grace, and I'll just write that there so you know how how to spell it. So prevenient grace there is the idea that God gives out this general grace for everyone that allows them to seek God. So it, you know, overrules their sinful nature where they don't seek God at all. It overrules that but and allows them, it brings them up to the standard where they can choose God if they, if they so wish. And that's how the Armenians get around chapter 3 there. Again, I don't think there's much biblical support for that, but it's definitely um, a way you can go. And it's also, I want to stress that it's not a salvific issue, whether you're an Armenian or a Calvinist. You're still saved, supposing that you have the Spirit of God. Just as we, we talked about, you know, the requirement is having the Spirit of God and being intent on the things of the Spirit. It's not being a Calvinist or an Armenian. I was going to say one thing on... Uh what you guys all like touch topic with and stuff um no one can no one has the nature to seek god um i feel like yes i get that and we don't but i feel like he seeks us knowing who he chooses, like in different ways even if someone doesn't isn't there to minister to someone god will show his glory through anything to show them that he is there kind of thing yeah i think that's another interesting way to look at it too Another good insight there. And it looks like in the text chat, we're talking about Jacob and Esau. That is another great example. In Romans 9, especially, has some other good examples with Pharaoh and things like that. So we're going to get into this a lot more in Romans chapter 9, which is for next week. But any final thoughts on 28 to 30 before we move on to the last chunk of Romans chapter 8. Actually, I kind of have a question thing. Um, If someone is living a life of sin and pain and they don't want that life anymore, them crying out for help and to see something that they can change, to see some hope kind of thing. I don't understand fully the seeking of that. They aren't seeking directly God. They're They're seeking help and God is seeking them to give them help. Yes? Um, are you talking about non-believers or believers? Non-believers, non-believers. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. In that sense, yeah, they want to be free from the, those kinds of struggles, and we know that they're groaning as well. But there is a, a slight disconnect between the help that they want 
and God and the help that he offers them, which only comes through their submission to him and, and their sacrifice, which I, I don't think they would want or they're, they're seeking that either. Yeah, I don't feel like they would seek that right away, but through their, their seeking for help that they would find God in the seek for help. But it's not directly them seeking, oh, I want God to help with these troubles, even though they have no idea about God. Yeah, that's a way of looking I'm just at saying, it. I would say that. I'm just saying this. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm just saying this because um, I've heard testimonies from many people who've dealt with things like this, trying to seek help from drug uh, habits and stuff like that, and them coming to God from searching for help. Yeah, I would pretty much go with what Hat just said there. If they go all the way to God, then that would simply be proof that God called them and predestined them in the first place. Yeah. So yeah, that's how I would I would answer that. And we are getting a little low on time here after all of that Calvinism and Armenian Armenian talk, but hopefully we can get more into that in chapter 9. So let's look at chapter 8, verses 31 to 39 now. And this is the last big chunk we have here. Any volunteers to read this part for us? I can. Great, go ahead. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give, give us all things? Who will bring charges against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is he who died, but rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or trouble or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are all killed all day or for, for your sake we are killed all day long. We were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Great. I just want to point out that <clears throat> we have just talked about it's God's work. He predestines, he calls, he justifies, he glorifies. And if you are predestined, it's guaranteed that you're going to be glorified. You're going all the way to salvation if indeed God chose you. And so Paul goes in with 31 with all of that in mind. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, that is if he's guaranteeing our salvation in that sense, who can be against us? And then he goes on and talks about the love of God and how we will not ever be taken away from that. And he, he gives up so many different items. So do we have any thoughts on the passage that we just read? Or anything that stood out to you? Well, there's so much power in verse 31 when it says, if God is for us, who is against us? Because it shows the awesome power that God has just in general. It's like as human beings, we struggle with so many things, but a lot of the time, we fail to understand that these things are happening, but it's not like they're out of any control at all. God has a grasp on every single portion of our lives, and he knows exactly how they're going to work in our lives. And at any moment, he can put something in our life or take something out of our life that we need. And we, we don't understand it at the time, but he knows exactly what he's doing with it. Yeah, that's another good thought. And I think it goes along with verse 36 there. You said, you know, we may be suffering, we may be persecuted, we may not understand what's going on. And I think that's one of the reasons that Paul uses the verse there in 36. On account of you, we are being put to death the whole day long. We are considered as sheep for slaughter. So even in light of all of that, God is still for us and he knows what's best for us. And he's bringing us to salvation. Any other thoughts there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, like, yeah, go just ahead. Like, just like Conifer, I found this is one of my favorite passages because just like going through anxiety and um, facing rejection from other people and 
and also just general suffering that happens in life. And I think a lot of churches do um, a disservice to their members by sort of preaching that Christianity is all about, you know, like it's a bed of roses. Um, And I was talking to a brother the other day who is probably like really close to becoming an apostate because he he was saying some pretty blasphemous things because I guess he had been promised this like peachy keen version of Christianity and he was seeing how God has caused him to suffer so much and and he didn't know that that was that Christianity entailed suffering um so I like that this passage lets us know like yeah we are gonna suffer but it's it can't overwhelm us because we have Jesus on our side and um verse 16 where it talks about how we're heirs with Christ and just like him we suffered but also just like him will be glorified um and Paul makes reference to I don't actually know which scripture this is but in verse 36 where he says um for your sake we are being put to death all day long we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered that reminded me of that verse in Isaiah that talks about Jesus being a sheep that was led to the slaughter and how just like our savior were persecuted but also just like him will be glorified yeah i really like that and i definitely agree with you that it is a disservice to you know preach that everything is all peachy keen for christians everything is going to be all good you know focusing on that verse 28 there and we know that all things work together for good for those who love god for those who are called according to his purpose and trying to twist that into a very materialistic sense but i think that's a great insight that we will be suffering but it will be ultimately good for us any final thoughts on that passage i also really love how in a lot of uh, verses in the scripture it'll kind of i guess for lack of a better term it'll kind of drag it on in a sense but the reason why i like it is because like for another example um when jesus was asked how many times we should forgive our brothers and sisters seven times and he replied with no you should forgive them 77 times or as as he was trying to imply there just be as forgiving as you possibly can and like don't let up on it it's sort of the same thing here where uh, where is it he says um i'm trying to find it here where he says all these things that like we could fear but I think it's uh, 34 I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities n- nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God. I think that's so great because it's not just saying like one or two examples, but it's covering such a wide variety of things that could be a common fear for human beings. And it's just him saying, hey, I got this covered. You don't have to worry about this. I am your savior. And as long as you rely on me, you're going to be okay in the long run. Yeah, definitely. I think that is, again, another wonderful passage. And Paul gives so many examples that he covers basically everything, nor things present, nor things to come. And that pretty much covers everything. And he emphatically says at the end, nor any other created thing, so that I can only think that Paul's purpose here is that he's using this all rhetorically to say that absolutely nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, I guess we can go ahead and start wrapping things up. That was chapter 8 that we just looked at. The first big chunk was about our adoption. We've been given that spirit of adoption. We are heirs, we're sons of God, and we have God's fatherly love upon us and we also learn that we're going to be suffering we groan and we wait for the fulfillment of that adoption and that full inheritance with the redemption of our body in time and we hope and we hope in all of these things and we go on we talked about calvinism and armenianism in verses 29 to 30 because those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he should be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined these he also called and those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified these he also glorified and we see this chain going through here we see this chain of salvation that is unbreakable 
And Paul makes this very certain in extremely clear terms that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would anybody like to close us out with a word of prayer? I can if you'd like. That would be great. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. We thank you for this uh, Bible study that you've given us. And we thank you that we've been so blessed with someone that you've given us, Lord. Every single day we go against you, and yet you give us so, so much, and we are so very grateful. We thank you for Mark for leading this and for all the people here who are willing to listen and give input. Thank you, Lord, in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all again for another great Bible study this week.